I know we're continuing our cocktail coverage, so let's have a nice cocktail this week. Let's talk about epinephrine. What's new with it? Find out today on Medical History Mysteries. So we've been talking for the last three weeks about different types of drug cocktails, and a lot of them are extremely dangerous. So one drug that we use all the time in dentistry, and sometimes we almost ignore it, you know, and don't really even think about the side effects of it, is epinephrine. Let's talk about it. Well, there's a lot of uh, interesting commentary about the use of epinephrine in dentistry and local anesthesia. Uh, from, from my friends on the medical side, and I've spoken for them on several occasions, their opinion is very simple. We put as, why do you use epinephrine? There's no reason for it. I see nothing but downside. I see three hours of, you know, tachycardia uh, in a patient who's predisposed to some type of, you know, cardiovascular risk uh, for a dental procedure, not worth it. So don't use epinephrine. But I think that's because maybe medical professionals don't see the value of epinephrine in dental procedures because maybe also they don't know the strength of epinephrine we use. Uh, you know, we use epinephrine in dilutions of one to 100,000 and one to 200,000. But, that, but that's dentistry. That's, we've always used it for that purpose. Vasoconstriction, that, that's our goal, okay? Vasodilation in local anesthesia is our enemy because it causes, you know, the anesthesia to drain quickly, right? So short duration of action. Then what? It allows more of the anesthetic to leave the injection site very quickly and end up in areas where we necessarily don't want it to be, like the brain and the heart. Slows cognition, slows cardiac conduction. And then what fills the hole in the meantime is blood. So that, it's just a, a lose, lose, lose proposition for us in dentistry. So we like to use epinephrine for as a vasoconstrictor because why? Epinephrine stimulates the alpha-1 receptors in the mucosa causing vasoconstriction. That means what? We lock the anesthetic in, can't get out, lasts a long time. Number two, the little that does get out doesn't really get here as much, so therefore we have less effect on cognition and cardiac conduction, and blood can't penetrate because of the vasoconstriction, so there's no bleeding. That's a win-win-win. So why wouldn't we want to use epinephrine? Well, that's because the epinephrine is a wascally wabbit, yes? Because it likes to go places where we don't want it to go. Like what? Well, it can leave the injection site eventually and stimulate receptors elsewhere in the body, like what? Beta-1 receptors, which is why epinephrine can cause tachycardia, right? Number two, it can find its way to beta-2 receptors in the skeletal muscle. Now, this is mostly because if you're using a long needle and you're performing something like a, a block injection, you might penetrate not the, just the overlying mucosa, but also the sub, uh, the, the part of the muscle, the muscle uh, that lies underneath the mucosa. So if you penetrate the underlying muscle with the needle and deposit epinephrine in the underlying muscle, in skeletal muscle, epinephrine acts as a vasodilator, which is, you know, again, contrary to what we might think. So that means what? That means that we have increased the risk of trismus, we've increased the risk of hematoma and bleeding in that, in that tissue, which can cause pain. Okay, so epinephrine is wonderful when it ends up where we want it to end up, and not so wonderful when it ends up in places we don't want it to go. Of course, of course as a side note, epinephrine is valuable in the fact that when you use uh, epinephrine in uh, the human body, it does ultimately uh, end up at beta-2 receptors in the lungs, causing bronchodilation, which means I can offset the bronchoconstriction of anaphylaxis with this bronchodilation effect of epinephrine, and that's why I can load epinephrine in an auto-injector, and if I get an errant peanut in my salad, and I'm allergic to peanuts, I can give myself an injection of epinephrine with this auto injector and quite literally save my own life. But we have to go back to the other point, which is why do medical doctors say don't use epinephrine? 
And the answer is because they believe they don't know the strength that we're using. They use what? One to a thousand. They don't use one to a hundred thousand. If you went up to an ER doctor and said, I, mean, I use epinephrine too. I use the one to 100,000 strength. That doctor may look at you and say, what are you going to do with that? Vasoconstrict? And you'd probably say, yes, that's why I use it. So yeah, I get it. They use one to 1,000, 100 times more concentrated than what we use in dentistry. Will they likely see three hours of tachycardia with one to 1,000 dilution epinephrine? Probably. Maybe if someone told them, if maybe we educated them and said, look, we use one to 100,000 for vasoconstriction, maybe they'd be okay with that. You mentioned once, I don't know, a while back when we talked about epinephrine that patients get nervous for their dental appointments and they have endogenous epinephrine that they release. And can you comment on the amount of endogenous epinephrine that they release in as it compares to what we would inject? It's a good question. And it deserves an answer, okay? First off, ask a patient what's one of the most stressful places they can find yourself, themselves. And I've told you many times, it's, their answer is gonna be a dental chair, right? But keep in mind that we don't have any control over the amount of endogenous epinephrine a patient produces. They're already producing epinephrine not only when they walk in the office, on their way there. I tell many medical doctors who say, don't use epinephrine. Doc, I got news for you. Your patient gets more epinephrine on the ride over here than they're ever gonna get when they get here because it's endogenous production based on stress, driving, traffic. But then they come in the office and you know, let's face it, they're not used to being in the office like you and I are. So they see things they don't wanna see, hear things they don't wanna hear, smell things they don't wanna smell. They sit in your chair and you put a bib on them. And they're like, what are we having, lobster? No, <laughs> little bits of mucosa, bone and tissue will fly out of your mouth periodically and stain your clothing. What? They're already keyed up as it is. And they can't see inside here, right? If you were doing hand surgery, at least they could watch. But inside here, everything's a surprise. So you're in there with metal instruments. And you know while their main part of their brain is saying, ah, this is all for my benefit, their lower brain is saying we're being attacked by some maniac in one of the most sensitive parts of our body with metal instruments, get up and run. So there's an outflow of endogenous epinephrine to begin with. Now, the problem is if you said, well, I'm not using epinephrine, I'm going to use mepivacaine, plain. Okay, realize that without the epinephrine, mepivacaine lasts about 40 minutes. 40 minutes goes by and your patient says, Oh, I felt that. What does that mean? Oh, you felt that? I'm going to give you more anesthesia. Okay, so I felt that surge of endogenous epinephrine. Oh, you felt that? Let me give you another injection, a surge of endogenous epinephrine. Now, I, now you give them the injection and it hurts more epinephrine. And now the clock's ticking. Why? Because the last one wore off. This one's going to wear off more epinephrine. So you could make the argument overall that the patient would have received less epinephrine if you just used epi in the first place, because the epinephrine would have blocked the anesthetic in, it wouldn't have, would have lasted much longer, there would have been no breakthrough pain, there would have been no second injection, there would have been no clock ticking. Overall, we could say that they would have received less epinephrine. But to your question, Pam, how much are they producing? And the answer is, we don't know. So therefore, wouldn't it be better if we controlled the amount of exogenous epinephrine we could give them, something that's under our control versus relying on the amount of endogenous epinephrine they're producing, which we don't have any control over? So do we just say, no, nah, I'm not going to worry about it. Everybody, epi for everybody. Is that a prudent approach? Well, again, this goes back to some of our previous conversations where the medical doctor has said, no epi for you. And if the doctor says no epi, I'd like to abide by his or her decision, right? I'm trying to be a partner here. Maybe there's a good reason for it. Or maybe the patient says, no, I don't want it. Okay, if they don't want it, why would I want to go against their wishes, right? I might be able to talk them into it, but maybe they just don't want it. Or people say, I'm allergic to epinephrine. Well, no, you can't be allergic to epinephrine. And if you were, don't get stressed out, you're going to die. So what's the third option? Well, the third one is the fact that I might have a sulfite allergy. 
And we know that epinephrine is inherently unstable in aqueous solutions like an anesthetic solution in a cartridge. To make it stable, we have to add acid, which means cartridges that contain epinephrine contain more acid. And we also have to add a antioxidant like sulfites, metabisulfite. If you have a sulfite allergy, I can't give you anesthesia with epinephrine. And you know what that means, right? Three out of the five anesthetic agents that we use in the United States only are available with epi. So there are cases when we can't use epinephrine. Now, in addition to that, there's patients who are pregnant who are told, you know, because you have preeclampsia, eclampsia, you can't have epinephrine. So there's, a, there's times when you really can't use epi. I get that. And that's why we've got to be very careful with documentation and making sure we're following the medical doctor's wishes as closely as we can. But you know what I'm going to say next? You're the doc. It's your patient. You know, you make the call. I like it. All right, everybody. I think you solved this. I know we'll be talking about this again in the future. So finally, a happy cocktail. I'm okay. glad we're kind of rounding out this cocktail series together, talking about epinephrine. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. All right, everybody. Make good choices. See you next week. Take care.